scripture reading this morning will be from the book of Matthew, chapter 23, verses 37 through 39. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who were sent to you, how often I wanted to gather you, your people together, just as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you didn't want that. Look, your house is left to you deserted. I tell you, you won't see me until you say, blessings on the one who comes in the Lord's name. Like this? Does that work? Okay. Just wave at me if, if anything's wrong. Um, but uh, the, the, the weather, it feels appropriate for, for the day before Jesus' resurrection, and we're thinking about Jesus being in the tomb, but this morning we're going to be looking at uh, Jesus uh, being resurrected in the morning. But before we go into some of what that story actually is and what we think of when we think of Easter and the resurrection, I want to think a little bit about something that happens before the events of the, the week leading up to the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, because when we talk about the resurrection, when we talk about Easter, we think about, we think about what happened not only back then to remember, but we also think about how we want to respond to it and how we want to be living and acting in our, in our lives today, right? So this morning, we're going to be looking at uh, just before the story of, of the death and resurrection of Christ, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 23, and Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and the legal experts here, and he's really uh, going off on them, uh, if you could say that. Um, I feel like we don't actually look at this passage that much or talk about it in church because it's pretty harsh. It's pretty... Um, Jesus, Jesus comes with some pretty solid burns here. So let's, let's read just a bit of Jesus' words here in verse 13, 23, verse 13. He says, But woe to you, you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. It's pretty harsh. But doesn't it feel a little good to read something like that too? And if, if you go and you read Matthew 23, there's a lot of this, especially starting in verse 13. That's kind of what kicks it off. But um, basically, there's a, most of chapter 23 in Matthew is a lot of Jesus saying, woe to you Pharisees, hypocrites. And then he, he, he like does a mic drop uh, roast on them. It's, it's pretty great. And it feels a little good when you're reading the story, right? Because everybody kind of knows the Pharisees are the bad guys of Jesus' story. Um, we, we often, we think of the Pharisees as the bad guys, and it feels like when Jesus kind of puts them in their place, it feels like when your teacher or your boss puts that one annoying student or coworker or classmate in their place, and it just feels, everything feels right with the world, you're like, yes, justice. Tell them, tell them what's what, Jesus. Tell those Pharisees what's going on. It feels good. And we love it when the bad guys get justice served. Um, but we also, we can all probably think of stories where, if you really think about it, the bad guys aren't really that bad. Um, probably the, the best example that comes to mind for me is uh, Hallmark movies. Have you guys, any Hallmark movie fans here? Yes, yes, uh, all, my, all my middle-aged and older ladies, yes. Um, 
I grew up, I grew up with, with a mom who, who loves Hallmark movies. Uh, shout out, mom. I know you're watching this. And uh, if it wasn't Sabbath, you'd probably watch a Hallmark movie after this. But uh, I grew up uh, on those movies. I love those movies. I've seen so many of them. And well, yes, uh, they are stereotypically very predictable. Um, it is still, uh, there's another factor about them that I, that I want to look at this morning and that I want to point out. Have you ever noticed that a lot of times the, the fiancé is maybe not as bad as they make him out to be? Because what, what happens is there's a girl from the city and she's dating a, a business guy, a, a financier who works on Wall Street. And uh, he's working on a million dollar deal and so he can't really do Christmas with her. So she says, all right, I'm going to go to this uh, undescript small town, America. And there just so happens to be there a gentleman who um, is smoking hot, uh, <laughs> chops wood randomly throughout the day, <laughs> loves puppies, uh, loves Christmas, and wants to make sure that she loves all of those things too. And she says, wow, maybe this is the guy that I should fall in love with. And of course, you're rooting for that guy over the guy who's just in a high rise somewhere and just doing business. And, uh, but if you stop and think about it, that guy, I mean, if it was real life and your fiance was like, hey, if we, if we celebrate Christmas the day after, I can get us a million dollars. I would probably say, okay, like I'll still, I will go to the Sabbath service, but it's okay. We'll do the dinner and the presents and everything the next day. Let's, let's, let's pay off those present dues and debts. For, let's just go with that. Maybe those guys aren't quite as bad guys as, as we think of them. Also, uh, sports movies are a great example of this. Uh, if you've ever seen the, the film Facing the Giants, which is a Christian movie, um, Yes, they make the opposite team's coach out to be a, a real not nice guy, and some of the players not be so nice either, but they're also high schoolers. And you're like, come on, yeah, build the wall, stop those high schoolers. And, and if you sit back and think about it, you're like, oh, wait, wait a minute, these are just some high schoolers that are playing football. Uh, another great example is Airbud. If you, if you know what Airbud is, Airbud is this golden retriever dog that plays sports. And of course, you're rooting for the golden retriever dog playing sports. But if you step back and think about it, those poor kids that had to lose to a golden retriever, they're just kids wanting to play some basketball and this golden retriever showed them up. Um, sometimes bad guys aren't necessarily as bad as we kind of write them off or we, we paint them to be. And I wanna ask this morning, if, what if the Pharisees were like that? And what if the Pharisees are simply the bad guys or are the bad guys because we've painted them to be that? And what if there's something more we should be thinking about them and we shouldn't be so quick to write them off? Because again, this morning we're, we're talking about Easter, but we were talking about also how we're reacting and living out because of the results of Easter. So we want to be thinking about this. So this morning the question is, what did the Pharisees actually do wrong? Well, Jesus makes it pretty plain in Matthew 23. If you go and you, you want to read all the nice little roasts that he does on them there, and he calls them hypocrites and all these different things, and uh, the wonderful verse in verse 13 we read. Um, but I don't want us to just gloss over that. We shouldn't just breeze past this and say, well, this is just Jesus putting the Pharisees in their place. That's just the bad guys getting what they deserve. Because what we need to remember this morning is that the Pharisees were people too. And they were godly people. They were so godly, in fact, that um, they worked very hard to every single day, every single moment of every single day, to follow the laws and the commandments of God to perfection. They were so godly that they were experts of God's laws and his commandments. They were sure that they were right in what they were doing. And they could also tell you and show you why they were right from passages of scripture, or passages from different texts or traditions. And if the Bible is a real book, a real story that happened with real people, and we today are real people as well, then we need to be thoughtful and careful that we don't follow the same path that the Pharisees did. And we need to think about where they went wrong and what actually happened. 
unless we want Jesus stepping up to us and, and calling us hypocrites and telling us all the things that we've done wrong and other people look at us and, Jesus, and say, yes, Jesus, put them in their place. We need to think about where the Pharisees went wrong. Stereotypically, I think Christians would probably consider the Pharisees hypocrites. Jesus says it himself in, in this verse and many other verses in chapter 23. Jesus says it a lot throughout uh, the Gospels. He calls the Pharisees hypocrites. And I'm, I'm going to be honest, I probably didn't know what the word hypocrite was before I knew what a Pharisee was. It's just synonymous, uh, which what we think of the, the Pharisees as. But is hypocrites really the best word to describe all of them and all that they are? And I'm not arguing with Jesus, to be clear, but I'm just saying, let's think about that. Because what does hypocrite really mean? Because when, when I think of hypocrites, I think of somebody who doesn't um, walk the talk. They don't practice what they preach, right? They say one thing, but they do another. They're, they're hypocrites. But if you think about that more deeply for just a second, and you think about what the Pharisees were, you might run into some problems with that being your definition of what they were. Because think of Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul, before he became Paul. He was a Pharisee. He was a godly man. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He calls himself the Jew of Jews. He believed what he believed, and he practiced what he preached. He was so convinced that he was right, and he had so many different reasons that he could prove that he was right, that he was hunting down Christians and people who believed or preached something opposite to what he believed. That doesn't really sound like not practicing what he preached to me. I also think many of the Sadducees or religious leaders who were around the temple or playing more of the politics game, maybe you could describe them as more uh, hypocritical, but the Pharisees are a unique case because they are people trying to actively live out the law and the commandments of God every single day. Let's remember what Jesus calls them. He says that they are Pharisees and legal experts. They are experts in the law. And I don't think these Pharisees became experts in the law so that they could hypocritically twist the words of Jesus or the words of God to, to fit whatever narrative they wanted. They didn't want to become experts in the law just so that they could gain their own power or their own uh, influence or their own money. They became experts in the law because they wanted to live in perfect harmony with God's will. And they lived that way too. So what's the problem? Why does Jesus call them hypocrites if what they were doing was seeking to live in accordance with God's will and God's commandments? Are they too perfect? Are they trying too hard? Why would Jesus have a problem with people trying to follow God's commandments and trying to live the right way and to live perfectly? Let's remember what Jesus says right out of the gate in his rant in verse 13. He says, you shut people out of the kingdom of heaven. You don't enter yourselves and you won't allow those who enter to do so who want to enter to do so. So they're gatekeeping, if you could use that term. Is that it? If that was their problem, they're standing at the gate saying, uh, playing the role of St. Peter saying, all right, you're in, you're out, you should come out, you, maybe we could let you in. If they're standing at the gate, then we really should be giving some thought to this because I know in church, it is easy for us to be gatekeepers. It is almost natural for us to sometimes view ourselves as under the umbrella, as brothers and sisters, and to see somebody else as outside the gate. Because we are inside the gate, it is easy for us to see ourselves as in and others as out. And that's what the Pharisees were doing. But Jesus says they do something even further. They're not just keeping people out. They're not even taking the steps in themselves. 
Isn't that crazy? What's the point of getting to heaven and living a godly life and being in harmony with Christ if all you want to do is keep others out and you don't even step into the goodness of God for yourself? What does Jesus say they do? Later on, he says in, in this rant, he says, you travel over sea and land to make one convert. But when they've been converted, they become twice the child of hell as you are. Adventism and our church is one of the most mission-oriented groups in the world, which is a wonderful and a beautiful thing. But is our motivation always to be spreading aid, love, and the gospel and the good news? Or are there times where it has been to convert other people to make ourselves feel better somehow? This is in no way an attack against the Adventist church. There's wonderful mission that has been done, especially by even people in this church. But I want us to be thinking about what our motivations are. Is it possible that we're losing something in the process? Is it possible to lose something in the process? Jesus doesn't say that missionary work is bad. He doesn't uh, chide them for going over sea and land to convert. But he says that there's, what's the point of converting someone to Adventism, to your faith, to your way of life, if all they know is doctrines? And they fail to know the gospel of a God who is love. What about the big picture? Jesus says later on, you can go to that next verse, you give to God a tenth of, of mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Be careful to notice here that Jesus says tithe is important, offering is important, but how are we giving our time and our resources to justice, peace, and to faith? Have you heard that verse from Micah? He says, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good, that you do justice you love mercy, and you walk humbly with your God. Jesus says, all the laws you are keeping, what you are believing has great value. But what's the big picture? When it comes to tithes, what's the point of giving 10% of your wealth to God if you're not giving 100% of your time and resources to the betterment of your family, your friends, your neighbors, the world? What's the point of having all the truth, all the truths of Adventism, if we somehow miss the big picture of the gospel to share with others? The truths have value and they should be shared, but only within the big picture of who God is and what the good news is. I don't pretend this morning to fully understand everything that the Pharisees did wrong. I, I would hope that I would never judge somebody as just the bad guy and pretend to know their story and their heart. That's God's job. That's not my job. But I do know that there is some big things that we can take away, some big things that we can learn from the Pharisees. The Pharisees worked so hard to get everything right that somehow they got it wrong. They wanted to please God. They wanted to be perfect so much. But when God came to them in the form of a man and walked among them and stood in front of them, he told them to their faces they had messed up. So what if perfection isn't the goal? I know for a fact that I probably don't follow God's laws and commandments uh, as perfectly as the Pharisees did. But what if that's not the point? What if the big picture isn't chasing perfection, but embracing imperfection in order to be made whole? Embracing who God is to fill the cracks of my imperfection 
to make me whole. Let's go one chapter backwards in the Bible to Matthew chapter 22. And it says this, when, Jesus, when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had left, the Sadducees speechless, they met together. One of them, a legal expert, tested him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? He replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. That's the big picture. Jesus himself said it. He says that all the laws are summed up in love God and love your neighbor. Jesus didn't say uh, forget the other laws. Jesus didn't say, forget sharing the gospel, forget tithe, forget trying to live your life in accordance to be as, as close to God's will as you can, as God has laid out a path for your life to be the best it can be. Don't stop trying to do that. Don't stop trying to share the goodness of a life well lived in accordance with God's will. He didn't say that, but he said, as you do those things, remember the big picture. Because the second you're doing it to put on a show or to chase perfection, you've lost your way. Jesus didn't come for people who didn't want a doctor. Jesus came for the sick. He didn't come for the people who were prepared for him by their own righteousness and had already wiped away all their sins by their own actions or their own doing. No. Jesus came to show love a love that supersedes imperfection. He came to show what it looks like to live under the love of God. He showed us grace. Remember, mercy is the saving action that was done for us by Jesus on the cross. But grace is what we live under now that it has been done for us, now that Jesus has risen from the grave. We need today to not chase perfection, but to embrace love and grace in our lives today. Tomorrow is Easter Sunday, and what is your focus going to be? Are you going to be celebrating the resurrection of Christ? Are you going to be sharing with others the, the goodness of a Jesus, of, of a Messiah who, who came and is resurrected? Or are you going to be focused on something else? Are you going to be focused on the actions of others? On people who are painting eggs and dressing up as bunnies? Or are you going to be loving them and seeking to share with them the good news? The celebration of the resurrection is not something that should take place once a year. It's something that should take place every Sabbath, every week every day. Easter is, though, a special time for us to reflect, to remember and to celebrate. But this Easter Sabbath, I challenge us to think, what did the Pharisees do so wrong? One, I think they lost sight of the big picture. They tried so hard to do everything right on their own that they lost God in the process. We cannot and we must not lose sight of the big picture. As we enter spring and new things as a church, as a community, as individuals, we cannot be like the Pharisees. We should be welcoming people into the gate, not standing at the gate, standing guard, telling people who to come in or who to stay out. We need to do good Yes, but we need to remember the big picture. We live today under a banner of love and a flood of grace that continually washes over us. Let that define us. Let us not simply be written off as people who tried to do right and chase perfection. Jesus says, don't worry about that. Let us be defined by the love that we have. Let us be defined as people who do good, and as we do good, 
we keep in mind the picture of who God is and our need for him in our lives. Let us be defined by our love for God and love for our fellow man, for our neighbors. The rest will come. Jesus says, for they will know you are my disciples by your love. For to know Christ is to know love. Let us love together, sharing the good news that Christ has indeed risen from the dead. Amen.